Hi, everybody. Uh, my lab, as you, uh, you heard yesterday from my introduction, deals with different aspects of biology. And of course, during this uh, crisis, we uh, stopped many of the things we were doing and started working on, uh, on SARS-CoV-2. And basically, we have interest in different aspects of biology, from basic aspects of the, that are related to uh, the interaction of the virus with the host cell, the host cell response to viral infection, more applied aspects like diagnosis uh, and surveillance, and as well as mechanisms of action of uh, antiviral drugs. And today I'll be focusing ex mostly on, on antiviral drugs for SARS-CoV-2. And the first, uh, uh, the first poll actually is very interesting. You can close it now. Uh, yeah, you have closed it. So basically is what are the current uh, currently available FDA approved drugs for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, I find this, uh, this uh, uh, site on the New York Times quite, uh, quite catchy because it uh, summarizes uh, what is the situation of antiviral drugs. So the answer to the poll was actually that only one is FDA approved, which is remdesivir. All the other drugs such as monoclonals uh, uh, are actually uh, still under emergency use uh, listing. So they're not really approved by FDA. So really, we are in need of antiviral drugs. There have been several drugs proposed in the past uh, year and a half. Uh, some of them raised some hopes, but then turned out to be not very promising, like uh, uh, chlorokine or uh, protease inhibitors uh, or ivermectin. Others that are uh, rising uh, as potential antivirals. And I'm talking, this, is, this was accessed actually in September, if you uh, look at this uh, uh, site uh, now, you will see that uh, one drug moved from uh, uh, tentative to promising, which is monopiravir, which is a drug uh, uh, targeting uh, the, uh, the polymerase of uh, the polymerase of the virus, like a metastasis with a different mechanism. So basically, there is a, a really now a huge effort to find to find antiviral drugs. So, but what, what is an antiviral drug? How you define an antiviral drug? So we can launch this, the second poll, which is uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, most of the drugs that have been tested so far, except for monopiria, no, also monopiria actually, are called repurposing drugs. What does this mean? So repurposing is a strategy. So let's wait for everybody to vote. Okay, I think you can close it now. Oh, exactly. So, okay, most of the audience got the answer right this time. And basically, uh, a repurposing means uh, to uh, uh, repurpose, to, to, to use a, a drug that has been uh, developed for another disease and uh, that is uh, also active against uh, a new disease. And, uh, uh, but this is not, not the only approach that can be used for antiviral drugs. Actually, it's not the best approach because the best approach is to find uh, direct antiviral agents, so drugs that actually target uh, specifically, specifically a viral target uh, of that specific uh, pathogen. Of course, when you have a, a, an emergency, you don't have available drugs. So the, the, this is an interesting uh, article that uh, was published uh, earlier this year is that basically what we had at our disposal during the epidemic was uh, empty shelves. So we didn't have an armamentarium. We didn't have a, a number of drugs that we could uh, immediately use for a new emerging disease. So really there is a need not only to find drugs for SARS-CoV-2 that are specific and efficacy uh, and, uh, and uh, work on, on the viral infection, but also we need to prepare ourselves to, to be more um, responsive to other crises of this sort. So um, uh, there are, these are some definitions. DA are called direct antiviral agents. So these are drugs developed specifically for a viral target. Drug repurposing, we already heard. Uh, we have also other terms like host direct antiviral therapy. These are drugs that act not on the virus, but on uh, pathways of the cells that are uh, um, that are important for infection. And then we have another class of drugs that are the monoclonal antibodies that are developed to neutralize uh, uh, viral infection. So these are drugs, but a bit different. Um, 
if you look at the uh, life cycle of the virus, you can cluster the drugs in different aspects of the life cycle. So here, this is an old slide actually, but uh, summarizes it well, you have uh, monoclonal antibodies that uh, would uh, target the spike protein and would uh, target the entry pathway of the virus. You have inhibitors of uh, uh, the processing of the virus in the endosomes or late endosomes that are, for example, chlorokine, although chlorokine is working in vitro, but it's not working in, uh, in vivo or working poorly in vivo, still is representative of a drug that uh, targets a pathway rather than specifically a target of the virus. So this would be a host-directed therapy rather than, uh, for example, remdesivir, which uh, acts directly on the polymerase and is therefore both a repurpose drug because it was developed previously for other viral infection, but also a, a direct antiviral agent. So uh, we have different targets and different possibilities to develop uh, uh, drugs against SARS-CoV-2. Um, there are different approaches, uh, uh, which I tend to divide them in top-down and bottom-up approaches. Bottom-up approaches are those that are based on large screening, loss of function or gain of function screening. So this means CRISPR or NAI screens, or expression screens or interactome studies that basically would find essential function that are required for viral infection, but then you need to find the drug that targets this essential function. On the other hand, top-down approaches really go to uh, screen for large libraries of drugs, uh, for example, FDA-registered drugs, investigational drugs, new drugs, but also uh, repurposing, so drugs already used for other diseases or traditional medicine or herbal extracts. So you have a wide variety of possible approaches for doing a, a drug screening. Uh, here you have the drug, so you find that a drug that is, a, uh, that is working against your target, but uh, you don't know the target, so you need to study more about uh, the uh, mechanism of uh, inhibition to get more information, optimize the drug approach. So at the early stage of the epidemic, we started uh, investigating uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and uh, started to uh, establish a platform where we could test different antiviral drugs. And this platform for initially was based uh, on uh, um, on basically on uh, a standard plaque assay. So basically uh, we isolated the virus from, uh, from local patients, we grew the virus in the lab. We developed uh, a plaque assay, which is a way to uh, identify the infectious virus and quantify the infectious virus. And we incubated drugs with the virus to uh, establish uh, the inhibitory activity. Then after that, we developed a more high throughput uh, assay based on uh, uh, cells that overexpress the AC2 receptor that are incubated with uh, the drug and the virus. And then we have developed our own antibody against the spike protein that can be used to detect the viral infected cells. And therefore we can monitor by a high throughput facility that is based here in, at the CGB and with the help of LUCA, the, um, we could establish the inhibitory activity of, uh, of, uh, of a drug. So uh, we have tested a really a large number of drugs, uh, drugs coming from libraries, drugs coming from collaborators, drugs coming from our own interest and uh, uh, work on other viruses. And we ended up with a number of drugs that were, uh, showed some level of activity against uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is a summary basically of the drugs that we are currently uh, working on. And these include, uh, the first one we identified is Miglustat. We'll see later how it works, but uh, this is a repurposing drug because it's a drug that is used for other diseases. We uh, basically established that it works uh, in vitro and uh, we understand the mechanism of action, we, uh, but we never advanced to a, a, a clinical trial. Um, Sergozivir is a similar drug that also inhibits uh, glycosylation and uh, is in preclinic and, and uh, testing for, for HCCV and dengue. So it's an investigational drug that can be also tested for SARS-CoV-2. It works in vitro in our hands. Uh, it has hydroxychloro-cholesterol um, derivatives uh, uh, are uh, in the preclinical testing and we need to move this forward. Nitoxaline is an antibiotic, uh, antibiotic so it's also a repurposing drug which is now uh, we have a randomized double-blinded phase three clinical trial in progress in Slovenia. Actually, authorization is in progress in Slovenia with our collaborators. 
ACUCH is a is a is a drug, is a new drug, is a herbal extract that, that is in progress. Uh, this is confidential, so I will not talk about this. But uh, it went well uh, in the in the randomized uh, clinical trials in India. And then we have Resdon, Elbazivir, and uh, Tiazolone derivatives that also were shown to be active in vitro. So this is a summary of the active drugs that we found that were screening hundreds and hundreds of drugs. And we start now a little bit more in depth in, in, with Miglostat, which was the first one we identified. Uh, so Miglostat is an immune sugar and was initially identified as inhibitor of HIV. So it was in, initially uh, actually developed as an antiviral drug. Um, is an inhibitor of uh, glucosidases and uh, glucosidase transferases activity, and is used to treat some genetic disorders such as Gaucher and Neiman Pix uh, type C. Uh, these are genetic diseases, very rare genetic diseases, but this means this drug is actually in clinical use. So we can, we can be immediately transferred to patients eventually. We found that, uh, <clears throat> uh, can you send the, the third poll, please? So, uh, what we found. So this is uh, the result of our um, of our work uh, in vitro. And, uh, and basically, what are you looking at when you are doing antiviral antiviral screening? So you're looking at the inhibitory activity, of course, of the cell of the of the drug, but also uh, to other aspects. So what is the selective index in vitro for new drugs? Uh, so interesting. So the answer here is not very clear, so the audience means that doesn't have really clear ideas. Actually, the selective index is the ratio between IC50 and CC50. IC50 is inhibitory concentration, the 50% inhibitory concentration, which is shown here in, with the black dots in the curve, and tells you how much the drug is inhibiting uh, your readout of infection. Uh, the CC50, the, cytoto the cytotoxicity of the drug, and this in this case is the red squares in the graphs, and basically it tells you how cytotoxic is the drug on, on the cells that you're using for assay. And the selective index is the ratio between the two. So really here you can see that, for example, the IC50 is around uh, 40 micromolar, so in, in, in this range here, while the CC50 is above 1,000, so the ratio is between 1,000 and 40 is the selective index. So you need, the greater the selective index, the more chances you have that your drugs are not is not giving you side effects when used in, in, in vivo. And uh, uh, the IC50 is the chance that your, uh, your drug is active uh, uh, also when administered to a patient eventually. So we have uh, uh, this data from Miglustat. Uh, the, uh, the next step was to basically, um, let me go to the next slide look at uh, when is this uh, drug active. And to do that, you do this kind of experiment, you do uh, a time of addition experiment where you add the drug either before infection or during infection or after infection. So pre, co or post. And basically uh, you can see clearly that uh, when you uh, add the drug exactly after, immediately after you infected the cells, you have the most activity of this drug, both in terms of infectivity and uh, genomes. And uh, uh, so genomes are here actually. At, uh, this is at 24, 48 hours. So, uh, and this is a, a, an indication of the viral protein. This is the nucleocapsid that also decreases uh, uh, if you treat uh, with the drug after infection. The uh, activity of this drug, as uh, uh, I was mentioning before, is against glycosylation. Spike is a prominent uh, glycosylated protein of, uh, of this virus. And here we, we show basically that uh, Miglostat inhibits uh, both the uh, conformation of the spike on the viral surface, because here we use an antibody against the, uh, uh, the, 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 the conformationally competent uh, spike protein, uh, and uh, which is decreased by treating with Miglostat. But when we use an antibody against a linear epitope, so it doesn't care about conformation of the protein on the cell surface, these are uh, cytophorometric cyto analysis. Uh, we see that there is only inhibition of uh, Miglostat. So it means that I affect the conformation of the spike protein and also affects the uh, release of the spike protein in the supernatant. So meaning that uh, has an effect on the incorporation of the spike in the virions. Um, a similar uh, drug to Miglustat is Elgozi. Elgozi also inhibits glycosylation. As I mentioned before, it's a drug that is, is an investigational drug for uh, dengue and hepatitis C. 
And also in this case, it shows a very good uh, um, uh, inhibitory activity against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, better than uh, Migrustat and a very good also uh, selective index. Uh, clearly, these are uh, two drugs that uh, could be uh, eventually tested uh, more uh, to a more advanced step. I must say that uh, the inhibitory concentration of Migrustat uh, from the pharmacokinetic of uh, Migrustat in vivo when used for the patients is not really fitting exactly the scheme. So we, we would need too much of the drug to have an effect uh, for the virus in vivo and therefore the side effect would be predominant. While for Sergozy, we, we need to move from uh, a preclinical drug to clinical testing. Uh, then uh, the next class of drugs that uh, showed a very good effect on SARS-CoV-2 were the derivatives of cholesterol. Cholesterol is processed in different, different way. There are different uh, metabolites, catabolites of cholesterol that are, have uh, several functions in our, in our body. We observed that uh, <clears throat> in patients with various uh, levels of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID disease, uh, they have a decrease of uh, uh, one of these derivatives, which is called 27-hydroxycholesterol, that clearly decreases with the severity uh, of the disease. And we found that this derivative basically is, a, is an inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2. So this is uh, uh, showing the effect of the, uh, 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 of the drug alone. So the drug alone is not effective, but when complex with a carrier that so allows it to cross the membranes, basically, you can see that you have an activity around two micromolar, which is uh, reasonable. Um, the, uh, uh, this drug is, uh, we showed that not only is able to inhibit uh, bioactivity by our assay, but also was shown to inhibit uh, the, the infected cells in, uh, in, uh, in a cell uh, immunofluorescence assay. Um, Another approach that we, we took was to screen for a number of molecules by, um, by an in-silico approach together with the uh, CNR in Milan. So basically they had a library of molecules, uh, which is the drug bank library, and they made some docking on the SARS-CoV-2 polymerase to identify drugs that could uh, bind and be then potential inhibitors of, uh, of, this, uh, of this target. And after different, uh, um, let's say, uh, rounds of uh, selection, they identified uh, 13 molecules plus another one for antiviral testing. So we proceeded to antiviral testing of, uh, of these drugs uh, and, and these are the results. So basically we found three drugs that uh, had a potential, uh, could be a potential inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2. These are, two of them are inhibitors of uh, of uh, hepatitis C virus, uh, and these are um, Elbazivir as well as Gazopervis. Uh, Elbazivir was shown to inhibit both uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 and also, and also uh, another coronavirus, OC43, which is uh, uh, already in the human population causing uh, common cold and therefore is a pan-coronavirus inhibitor, so would fit a class of uh, pan-inhibitors of uh, this class of, uh, of viruses, while grasopervir seems to be selective for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Lurazidone is an antipsychotic that, uh, that is quite active against SARS-CoV-2. We don't know the mechanism, and uh, um, it would be interesting uh, to test further in uh, uh, because, of, uh, because it would be a repurposing drug and would be pan, a pan inhibitor of uh, different uh, coronavirus because it's also active against the uh, OC43 uh, corona. Um, uh, together with the University of Ljubljana, we also investigated drugs that uh, inhibit the catepsin. Catepsin are proteases that are important for the processing of the spike protein during infection. And uh, with this uh, analysis, we identified nitroxolin, which is an antibiotic, which shows a promising activity against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and, and this uh, compound 17 is a derivative of nitroxolin that is also active. You can see a very good uh, inhibitory activity around two micromolar of uh, uh, nitroxolin and compound 17, as well as a, as a good uh, selective index. 
we investigate a little bit this further. Um, as you can see here, during infection, we have two alternative ways of uh, cell entry of the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. One is through uh, at, uh, binding of uh, spike to IC2 and cleavage by the protease TMPSS2. Another one is to endocytosis and uh, cleavage by also by catepsin of the uh, uh, spike precursor to get a full uh, uh, fusion and, uh, uh, and release of the virus in, in, the, in, the, in the cytoplasm. And uh, the doses using clinical for this, uh, for this uh, uh, antibiotic is are around uh, 400 milligrams and uh, if it's administered orally for this uh, for a urine infection so it's an old drug uh, so is a uh, the active compound in the urine so the pharmacokinetic of this compound is around 10 micromolar consider that we have a two micromolar uh, ec50 of our compound in vitro this means that it could reach the levels that are uh, observed during uh, treatment with uh, with this drug um interestingly uh, this uh, this drug also opens up some more uh, aspects more related to the physiology of the virus because uh, uh, we observed that uh, the, um, the catepsin are not the same in all cells. And basically when we tested this drug within different cell lines, so the first experiment were done in HOA7 cells, but we also tested zero cells and CARO3 cells, the target of this drug, catepsin B, is, uh, is, uh, is differentially expressed, but also differentially active in different cells. And you can see, for example, in CALO3 is highly expressed, while in VeroCell is much less expressed. And this uh, correlates with the activity of this drug uh, uh, in the cell lines. For example, CALO3 and HOA7, you have a good uh, micromolar, low micromolar in vitro activity, while in VeroCell is a bit less active. So we have to understand a little bit better what is the maximum reduction of this cell of this uh, of this drug, and this would also teach us a little bit more about the mechanism of viral entry of SARS-CoV-2. Um, to conclude, uh, basically, uh, we also uh, you know before the pandemic we were testing another class of drugs, which is called uh, which are thiazolone derivatives. And we found that these drugs were active against uh, uh, flaviviruses, and in particular here is shown the activity against uh, Ozutu virus, for example, uh, but also is active against dengue virus, Zika, and so on. And they have a very good IC50, and uh, uh, we found that these drugs were basically virucidal. So if you incubate these drugs with the, with the virus, they would lead to a non-infectious virus. Um, and uh, we could show this uh, in different ways. Here is uh, shown basically that if you pre-incubate uh, the drug with the virus, the, the, the virus is not able to infect. If you do electron microscopy on the virions incubated with the, this, uh, these drugs, uh, you see that the virions are, uh, are for, they, they show malformation of the, the structure with these kind of uh, holes uh, in the membrane that uh, we, we need to understand better what they mean. When we tested this drug for uh, SARS-CoV-2, we showed that it was active and also virucidal. So we both, uh, uh, we could show that also these derivatives uh, are uh, inhibitory, not only on, on flavivirus, but also coronaviruses. But basically we showed that it's active against all enveloped viruses and inactive against uh, non-enveloped viruses. So I'm closing here. Uh, just want to thank first uh, uh, a lot of contribution that allows us to work. So really both public and private uh, contributors to our research. And I want also to thank, uh, because I forgot at the beginning, but we'll do it now, uh, the people in my group, because basically everybody stopped what they were doing at the beginning of the epidemic. They started contributing to this, uh, to this research, to all these lines of research with their, with their expertise. And it has been really a team effort uh, for us, uh, requiring uh, both skills and uh, you know, ability to work in the BSL3 environment. Uh, and really, I'm grateful to all of them here, are the ones that are with me now, but some people already left. But I'm really grateful to all of them for their, for their help. And thank you for the attention.